Hi friends, it's Roz Reads. Today we're reading Good Inside by Dr. Becky Kennedy. And this is a, a long book. It's really a book about being a parent. But I thought a lot of kids would enjoy this and learn some things. So because it's so long, we're just going to read the highlights. Some of my highlighted notes. Here's Dr. Becky. She's awesome. She's got a podcast called Good Inside. Check her out. Her work is awesome and wonderful. Buy the book. Get it from your library if it's available. This is wonderful content. All right, here we go. Introduction. I know the parent I want to be. I don't know how to get there. Please help me fill the gap. Behavior is a clue to what a child and often an entire family system is struggling with. What my child is struggling with and what's my role in helping them? And hopefully also, what's coming up for me about this situation? Behaviorism is a theory of learning that focuses on observable actions rather than non-observable mental states like feelings and thoughts and urges. Behaviorism privileges shaping behavior above understanding behavior. It sees behavior as the whole picture rather than an expression of underlying unmet needs. This book is an initiation into a parenting model that is as much about self-development as it is about child development. Part one, Dr. Becky's Parenting Principles. Chapter one, good inside. Let me share an assumption I have about you and your kids. You are all good inside. And when I say good inside, I mean that we all at our core are compassionate, loving, and generous. The principle of internal goodness drives all of my work, and I hold the belief that kids and parents are good inside, which allows me to be curious about the why of their bad behaviors. There is nothing in this book as important as this principle. It is the foundation for all that's to come, because as soon as we tell ourselves, okay, slow down, I'm good inside. My kid is good inside too. We intervene differently than we would have if we allowed our frustration and anger to dictate our decisions. Differentiating who someone is from what they do is key to creating interventions that preserve your relationship while also leading to impactful change. Assuming goodness enables you to be the sturdy leader of your family. Because when you're confident in your child's goodness, you believe in their ability to behave well and do the right thing. And as long as you believe they are capable, you can show them the way. This type of leadership is what every child craves someone they can trust to steer them down the right path. It's what makes them feel safe, what allows them to find calm, and what leads to the development of emotional regulation and resilience. Providing a safe space to try and fail without worrying they'll be seen as bad is what will allow your child to learn and grow and to ultimately feel more connected to you. But operating from a good inside perspective 
can be harder than it seems, especially in difficult or highly charged moments. It's easy, reflective even, to default to a less generous view for two main reasons. First, we are evolutionary wired to see with a negativity bias, meaning we pay closer attention to what's difficult with our kids or with ourselves, our partners, even the world at large, than to what is working well. Second, our experiences of our own childhoods influence how we perceive and respond to our, uh, our kids' behavior. So many of us had parents who led with judgment rather than curiosity, criticism instead of understanding, punishment instead of discussion. I'd guess they'd had parents who treated them the same way. And in the absence of intentional effort to course correct, history repeats itself. As a result, many parents see behavior as the measure of who our kids are, rather than using behavior as a clue to what our kids might need. What if we saw behavior as an expression of needs, not identity? Then, rather than shaming our kids for their shortcomings, making them feel unseen and alone, we could help them access their internal goodness, improving their behavior along the way. Shifting our perspective isn't easy, but it's absolutely worth it. Or put more simply, now that we know a person's bad behavior is really a sign that they're struggling on the inside, did you learn to approach your struggles with criticism or compassion, with blame or curiosity? The most generous interpretation. Finding the good inside can often come from asking ourselves one simple question. What is my most generous interpretation of what just happened? I ask myself this often with my kids and my friends, and I'm working on asking it more in my marriage and with myself. Whenever I utter these words, even internally, I notice my body soften and I feel myself interacting with people in a way that feels much better. So here's an example. My most generous interpretation of my child's response is this. Hmm. My son really wishes he was included in this special lunch. I can understand that. He's sad and jealous. Those feelings are so big in his small body that they explode out of him in the form of big, hurtful words. But what's underneath is a raw, painful set of feelings. Here's another reason I like thinking in terms of MGI, most generous interpretation. At all times, but especially when our kids are dysregulated, meaning their emotions overwhelm their current coping skills, they look to their parents to understand. Who am I right now? Am I a bad kid doing bad things? Or am I a good kid having a hard time? If we want our kids to have true self-confidence and to feel good about themselves, we need to reflect back to our kids that they are good inside, even as they struggle on the outside. You're a good kid having a hard time. I'm here. I'm right here with you. There's nothing more valuable than learning to find goodness under our struggles because this leads to an increased capacity to reflect and change. All good decisions start with feeling secure in ourselves and in our environment, and nothing feels more secure than being recognized for the good people we truly are. So if you remember nothing else from this book, remember that you are good inside. Your child is good inside. 
If you return to that truth before you begin all your attempts at change, you will be on the right path. Chapter two, two things are true. What do I mean by understanding and not convincing? Well, when we seek to understand, we attempt to see and learn more about the other person's perspective, feelings, and experience. We essentially say to that person, I'm having one experience and you are having a different experience. I want to get to know what's happening for you. It doesn't mean you agree or comply. These would imply a one thing is true perspective or that we are wrong and our truth doesn't hold. It means we are willing to put our own experience aside for a moment to get to know someone else's. When we approach someone with the goal of understanding, we accept that there isn't one correct interpretation of a set of facts, but rather multiple experiences and viewpoints. Understanding has one goal, connection. And because connecting to our kids is how they learn to regulate their emotions and feel good inside, understanding will come up over and over again as a goal of communication. What's the opposite of understanding? For this argument's sake, it's convincing. Convincing is the attempt to prove a singular reality, to prove that only one thing is true. Convincing is an attempt to be right and as a result, make the other person wrong. It rests on the assumption that there's only one correct viewpoint. When we seek to convince someone, we essentially say, you're wrong. You are misperceiving, misremembering, misfeeling, misexperiencing. Let me explain to you why I am correct, and then you'll see the light and come around. Convincing has one goal in mind, be right. And here's the unfortunate consequence of being right. The other person feels unseen and unheard, at which point most people become infuriated and combative because it feels as if the other person does not accept your realness or worth. Feeling unseen and unheard makes connection impossible. Understanding, two things are true, and convincing, one thing is true, are two diametrically opposed ways of approaching other people. So a powerful first step in any interaction is to notice which mode you're in. When you're in one thing is true mode, you're judgmental of and reactive to someone else's experience because it feels like an assault on your own worth, your own truth. As a result, you will seek to prove your own point of view, which in turn makes the other person defensive because they need to uphold the realness of their experience. In one thing is true mode, exchange, exchanges escalate quickly. Each person thinks they're arguing about the content of the conversation, when in fact, they're trying to defend that they are a real worthy person with a real truthful experience. By contrast, when we're in two things are true mode, we are curious about and accepting of someone else's experience. And it feels like an opportunity to get to know someone better. When we approach others with openness, and so they put down their defenses. Both parties feel seen and heard, and we have an opportunity to deepen connection. This book is so good. I hope you guys go to the store and get it. As parents, we can make decisions that we think are best and care about our kids' feelings about those decisions. These are two totally separate things, working on holding both truths while working on allowing both realities. This is essential to building understanding and in turn connection with our kids.
Two things are true is a foundational parenting principle because it reminds us to see our child's experience or a co-parent's experience as real and valid and worthy of naming and connecting to. And it also allows us to hold on to our own experience as real and valid and worthy of naming and connecting to. It reminds us that logic doesn't overpower emotion. I may have a valid reason for doing something. And also, someone else has a valid emotional reaction. Both are true. But what if two things are true? Now you can do both. I am holding my boundary that my child cannot watch this movie and validating that my child feels upset, disappointed, angry, and left out. So she's got all these great examples. Okay. When children feel seen and sense their parent is a teammate and not an adversary, and when they're asked to collaborate in problem solving, good things happen. Now let's say you're insisting your child wear the jacket. It's two degrees outside with 50 mile an hour winds. This isn't a control thing, but a true safety thing. Bad behavior comes from dysregulated feelings that we cannot manage. What helps us manage the unmanageable? Connection. Child. I hate you. You're the worst. Parent. Takes a deep breath. Says to yourself, my child is upset inside. His outside behavior is not a true indication of how he feels about me. He is a good kid having a hard time. Then the parent says out loud, I do not appreciate that language. You must be really upset, maybe about some other things too, to be talking to me like this. I need a moment to calm my body. Maybe you do too. Then let's talk. You can also say this to yourself. Two things are true. I am having a hard time and I'm a good parent. I am a good parent having a hard time. Chapter three, know your job. Every member of a family has a job. Parents have the job of establishing safety through boundaries, validation, and empathy. Children have the job of exploring and learning through experiencing and expressing their emotions. When it comes to jobs, we all have to stay in our lanes. Our kids should not dictate our boundaries and we should not dictate their feelings. First and foremost, our job is to keep our children safe, physically and psychologically. When you carry your child to your, their room to sit with them because they are out of control and need containment, remind yourself, I am doing my job of keeping my child safe. My child is doing their job of expressing feelings. We are both doing what we need to do. I can handle this. Children are more able to experience strong feelings than they are able to regulate those feelings. And the gap between experiencing strong feelings and regulating those feelings comes out as dysregulated behavior. Think of hitting, kicking, screaming. Boundaries are not what we tell kids not to do. Boundaries are what we tell kids we will do. Boundaries embody your authority as a parent and don't require your child to do anything. So 
and examples of not boundaries. Here are examples of not boundaries, but instead ways we essentially ask our kids to do our jobs for us. In these scenarios, despite our attempts to shut down a behavior, it usually escalates further, not because our kids don't listen, but because their bodies feel a lack of containment. The absence of a sturdy adult keeping them safe is more dysregulating to them than the original issue. So if the parent just says, please stop hitting your brother, stop running. Didn't we say you'd be done after this show? Can't we be done? Why do you have to make this so hard? Parents just using words, parent is not doing their job. In each of these examples, parents are asking their kids to inhibit an urge or desire that frankly, they are developmentally incapable of inhibiting. We cannot tell a child who is hitting someone to stop hitting, or a child who is running to stop running, or a child who's complaining about wanting more TV to stop complaining, because these words from our mouth won't be successful. Why? Because we cannot control someone else. We can only control ourselves. And we, when we ask our child to do our job for us, they are more likely to get further dysregulated because we are essentially saying, I see that you are out of control. I don't know what to do here, so I'm gonna put you in charge and ask you to get yourself back in control. This is terrifying for a child because when she is out of control, she needs an adult who can provide a safe, sturdy, firm boundary. This boundary is a form of love. It's a way of saying, I know you're good inside and you're just having a hard, out of control time. I will be the container you need. I will stop you from continuing to act in this way. I will protect you from your own dysregulation taking over. Validation is the process of seeing someone else's emotional experience as real and true, rather than seeing someone else's emotional experience as something we want to convince them out of or logic them away from. Validation sounds like this. You're upset. That's real. I see that. Invalidation or the act of dismissing someone else's experience or truth would sound like this. There's no reason to be so upset. You're so sensitive. Come on. Remember, all human beings, kids and adults, have a profound need to feel seen in who they are. And at any given moment, who we are is related to what we are feeling inside. When we receive validation from others, we start to regulate our own experience because we borrow someone's communication of realness when we receive invalidation. We almost always get further dysregulated and escalated because now we have the experience of being told we are not real inside. Very few things feel as awful as this. Yes. Dr. Becky knows what she's talking about. When someone agrees, some, when someone greets us with empathy, oh, that feels so hard. We have that experience that Daniel Siegel describes as feeling felt. Our bodies also sense that someone else is present in our emotional experience, which makes the experience more manageable, thereby building our ability to regulate the feelings. This is the difference between your child saying, I'm so mad at my sister, regulating anger, and your child's hitting her sister, dysregulation. So when you can say what you're feeling versus doing the action with your hands, that's the difference between regulating and dysregulating. She gives a couple different examples. So here's some boundary setting examples. We'll do the screen time one because I can relate. 
Screen time is over now. I'm going to turn off the TV. Then you go, you turn off the TV, you place the remote somewhere it cannot be reached by your child. Then you say to your child, you wish you could watch another show. I know, stopping TV time is so hard for me too. Want to tell me the name of the one you want to watch tomorrow? I'll write it down for us so we don't forget. So the importance of boundaries, validation, and empathy help build, children build regulation skills. And she says, the kid is thinking, this feeling feels scary and overwhelming to me, but I can see it's not scary or well overwhelming to my parent. Over time, children absorb this containment and can access it on their own. And when parents get in the habit of validating a child's experience and empathizing with it, they are essentially saying to that child, you are real, you are lovable, you are good. A child's job in a family system is to explore and learn. through experiencing and expressing their emotions and wants. All right, so here's another example. I say to my son in the time before separation, sweetie, I know it's so hard for you when mommy has to work. That makes sense. You love being by mommy's side. You will be with daddy and I will see you for lunch. Mommy always comes back. I set boundaries that felt right to me and I expressed validation with my words and empathy with my tone. My son protested and screamed and cried. He did his job. He experienced and expressed feelings. In response, I said, I know it's so hard, sweetie. You're allowed to be upset. I love you. And then I left. Validation, empathy, boundary. He cried. Again, experiencing and expressing feelings. So she talks about how it's not easy, but this is the work we gotta do as parents. Chapter four, the early years matter. Children's experiences with their parents in their earliest years impact how they think about themselves, what they learn to expect of others, what feels safe and good, and what feels threatening and bad. Feeling satisfied with oneself, tolerant of failure, firm in boundaries, capable of self-advocacy, and connected with others. All of these important adult dynamics come from our early wiring. The first years of life set the stage for the next hundred years. It is through a child's attachment that all of his basic needs are met. Food, water, emotional security. Okay, here's an example. The behavior. A child is tantruming about wanting ice cream for breakfast. Parent response number one. I've done this one so many times. I won't talk to you while you're having a fit. Go to your room and come out when you're being responsible or reasonable. The attachment lesson is when I want something, I push people away. I become bad. I am left abandoned and alone. People only want to be around me when I'm easy and compliant. Yes, I heard this a lot when I was a kid. Parent response two. I know, sweetie, you wish you could have ice cream for breakfast. That's not an option right now. You're allowed to be upset about it. Attachment lesson number two. 
I am allowed to want things for myself. Wanting things for myself is allowed in close relationships. Behavior. A child is hesitant to join a birthday party clinging to his mom. Parent response number one. You know everyone here, come on. There's nothing to be worried about. Attachment lesson number one. I can't trust my feelings because they're ridiculous and overblown. Other people know better than I do how I should feel. Parent response number two. Something about this feels tricky. I believe you. Take your time. You'll know when you're ready. Attachment lesson number two. I can trust my feelings. I'm allowed to feel cautious. I know what I'm feeling and I can expect other people to respect and support me. The more children feel they can depend on a parent, the more independent the child can be. Our confidence that someone will understand us, not judge us, and support us, comfort us when things go wrong. This is what allows kids to develop into adults who are assertive, confident, and brave. This is why it's so critical to separate what a child does, which may be bad, from who a child is, good inside. Of course, we don't want our kids to hit behavior, but we do want our kids to have the right to feel angry, feeling. Of course, we don't want our kids to have a meltdown at the store, behavior, but we do want our kids to maintain access to desire and the right to speak up for themselves, feelings. Of course, we don't want our kids to eat only cereal for dinner, behavior, but we do want our kids to believe that they have sovereignty over their bodies and that they can sense what feels good inside of them, feelings. Chapter five, it's not too late. It's not too late to repair and reconnect with your kids and change the trajectory of their development. Repair is the best parenting tool, the, the most effective. Neuroplasticity refers to the brain's ability to relearn and transform itself when it recognizes the need for adaption. You're someone who is brave enough to reflect and grow and try new things. This is why I'm here too. I don't have it all figured out. I have plenty of my own anxieties and points of reactivity, and I consider myself a member of this amazing community of cycle breakers and forever learners. Children who are left alone with intense distress often rely on one of two coping mechanisms, self-doubt and self-blame. With self-doubt, kids invalidate their own experience in an attempt to feel safe in their environment again. They might tell themselves, wait, my mom didn't actually just say those awful words to me. That couldn't have happened, no way. Yeah, no, I must have remembered that wrong. After all, my mom hasn't apologized yet or even said anything to me about it. She definitely would say sorry if she said those words. Kids use self-doubt to protect themselves from the overwhelming feelings that would arise if they accepted the reality of real, what really just happened. They do this because being alone in their feelings seems like too much, and self-doubt offers a way to escape and self-preserve. 
And yet a child is wiring herself to believe, I don't perceive things accurately. I overreact. I cannot trust how things feel to me. Other people have a better idea of my reality than I do. This is a scary circuit to build because it leads to teens and adults who don't trust themselves and cannot locate their intuition. Instead, they use other people's treatment of them to define who they are and what they deserve. Self-blame. Self-blame is the, is the kid telling themselves, I'm a bad kid who, doing, who does bad things. When we become an adult, we layer self-blame, I am such a bad parent, onto tough moments. And because we are consumed by our not good enoughness, we find ourselves unable to make productive change. So self-doubt, I don't trust how I see things. Self-blame, I'm bad. I'm a bad person doing bad things. And when you have that self-blame, you can't move forward as easily. But if we develop the skill of going back non-defensively to our kids and showing them that we care about the discomfort they experienced in those rupture moments, then we're tackling the most important parenting work of all. What does repair look like? There's no one right way to repair. The key element is connection after disconnection. A parent's calm and compassionate presence after a moment marked by dysregulated reactivity. When we return to a moment that felt bad and add connection and emotional safety, we actually change the memory in the body. The memory no longer has such overwhelming, I'm alone and bad inside labels. It's now more nuanced as we layer on support after criticism, softness after yelling, understanding after misunderstanding. The ability to transform the body's memory is pretty amazing, and it's what always motivates me to repair with my own kids. Say you're sorry. Share your reflections with your child. Restating your memory of what happened so your kid knows it wasn't all in his head. And then say what you wish you had done differently and what you plan to do differently now and in the future. It's important to take ownership over your role. Mommy was having big feelings that came out in a yelling voice. Those were my feelings and it's my job to work on managing them better. It's never your fault when I yell, and it's not your job to figure out how I can stay calmer. I love you. Instead of insinuating that your child made you react in a certain way. And remember, as a parent, you are your child's role model. When your child sees you as a work in progress, he learns that he too can learn from his struggles and take responsibility when he acts in a way he isn't proud of. Never ever doubt the power of repair. Every time you go back to your child, you allow him to rewire, to rewrite the ending of the story, so it concludes in connection and understanding, rather than aloneness and fear. All right, friends, we're gonna stop at chapter five. We'll pick up in another video with chapter six. Um, I highly encourage you to get this book. This is Roz Reads. Please like this video. Please subscribe to my channel. Please share this content with your friends. And if you wanna reach out and say hi, can send me an email, rosreads1 at gmail.com. And this has been Good Inside by Dr. Becky Kennedy. Thank you so much for listening. We'll catch you on the next video. Bye.